So believe it or not, this is actually the world in which we live. Change in time. And in this world, most of us, and especially the organizations in which we are all in, whether they be academic or political or business or anything else, we are all doing this. We are incrementally, slowly, but, but, but uh, persistently making things better. Little by little, little by little. And what that does is, hopefully, uh, you gradually start to go up um, over time. That's the goal, right? This is how we all think. This is how every organization I've ever worked at thinks. And this is how things are. And this is how we're taught in school. And, but the problem is, is this is not real. The problem is, is that really this is the linear path to doom. And why this is the linear path to doom is that if you're only slowly and meticulously getting better and better, little by little, and doing nothing else, something will happen. And that's because change today, and it's always been, but it's especially apparent today, change today is exponential. And what that means is that the variables and the things that are happening are happening faster and faster, and so change is happening faster and faster in more unexpected ways. And the variables that go into this curve are harder and harder to predict. So by definition, it's hard to predict the unexpected, right? But if your organization is working on the linear path, but you live in an exponential world and you don't know it, what happens? Bad things happen that you don't see coming. And we see it time and time again, and especially in business. There was a time, not too long ago, I'm not that old, uh, where Blockbuster was everywhere, right? And now they're gone. And why? They were constantly, tiny little bit by little bit, improving their product and service. These weren't bad people. They weren't doing anything wrong, but they were living and working on the linear path to doom. And they did not realize that they were on the exponential curve. And the example of the exponential curve in their business and the thing that came seemingly out of nowhere was Netflix and all the other video on demand services and other things, right? It's a big deal. So it's really important. And if you take nothing away from my talk today, I hope that you realize you live in an exponential world and you can apply this frame, this way of thinking in everything that you do. But there's also a couple of points that I want to make about this exponential world. One is that there's this deceptive disappointment part of the curve. When something new and bold and something truly disruptive and crazy comes out, what initially happens is there's huge hype, and then when people actually use it, there's massive disappointment. Right? Once again, I'm not that old. But when I was younger, I remember when virtual reality was in all the arcades. And you'd try it on, and there were like these cubes and stuff, and you would get really sick. And then all of a sudden, the virtual reality di devices kind of disappeared. But then there's always this core group of people that are working on and building things and building until all of a sudden it shows up almost again out of nowhere on this exponential curve and things take off, much like virtual reality. You know, a couple of years ago, no one was really talking about virtual reality, but then Oculus Rift came out and now there's a thousand other things like and everyone's talking about augmented and virtual reality, right? Once again, almost out of nowhere, but yet it's on this exponential curve. Then what you have is if you're prepared and you're working on this exponential curve, you can build during the disappointing, dis de deceptively disappointing phase, and you can really maximize the benefit on the disruptive opportunity. If you're preparing at the bottom when things, no one else is thinking about it, when it finally shows up almost out of nowhere, you can do a lot. And so we, in my organization, in my company, we believe that we live in an exponential world, but we recognize that 99.9% .9 of the company needs to be focused on the linear path. There's nothing wrong with that. That's actually a really good thing. You don't want me doing your accounting. Someone's got to do all of those things to keep the ship going. But on the same token, if you realize that the, you live in this exponential world, you need to have a group of people on the outside creating possible things that could be the next thing. It's better that you disrupt yourself rather than allow someone else to do it to you, right? Another thing that really illustrates this is in the S&P 500, six, in 1920, the average time on that list was 67 years. Now it's only 15. And that just proves, once again, that that exponentiality, how fast things are changing, is happening faster and faster and faster. And that does not ju it's not just for business, it's for any, any organization. But, okay, that's great. Uh, I believe it. I believe you. Uh, we live in an exponential world. Great. Uh, what do we do? Great question. Um, 
There's a, two big problems here. If you believe that you live in this exponential world and you can literally do anything, and anything could come out of nowhere seemingly and disrupt your world, what that means is you could literally do anything to disrupt your own world. And being able to do anything is daunting. And that leads to this paradox of choice of what do we do? So I'm going to go ahead and give an example here, and bear with me, I will tie it all together, right? So this is President Kennedy, and November 22nd, 1963, was the day that he was assassinated. The entire world knows this story, right? It's a big deal, it was a big event. And right after he was shot, the entire world wanted to know one, the answer to one question, and that was, who shot him? <coughs> Seems really simple, right? There, were, there was video going on. This was a whole press event that was happening. There were people lined up. This shouldn't be a really hard thing to figure out. But it was, and it still continues to be today. And let me start off by saying, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I really enjoy reading about conspiracy theories. Let me just set that straight. Not a conspiracy theorist like conspiracy theories. So here we go. One of my favorite conspiracy theories is called The Umbrella Man. And this is the, one, of, one of the screenshots, um, one, of, one of the stills from the famous video of the motor car going, going past there in Dallas. So this is Dallas, Texas. It's November, but it's Dallas. There, there's not a cloud in the sky. It's warm. And you can see there the people in the crowd. No one's wearing a jacket. No one definitely doesn't have an umbrella out. And this is right at the moment that President Kennedy was shot, the exact moment. And, if you're, and when they were reviewing the footage, they noticed something very peculiar, and that was that there was this one guy wearing a dark wool suit, three-piece suit, and he had an umbrella open. Isn't that bizarre? That is really, really weird. And so if at this exact moment, this is once again the frame where President Kennedy is shot, and you see this, you think, what is that guy doing there? Right? It's a, pretty, it's a pretty honest thing. You want to know what this guy was doing. And this theory became the umbrella man theory. Who's the umbrella man? And of course, like we all do, we speculate wildly, this umbrella man here. You speculate wildly. And of course, when you speculate wildly, there's money to be made. So people write books, and they do all kinds of things. And this is a real book that was written about this guy, who he might be. Some people thought he might be hired by the KGB. He might be hired by the Cubans. He might have been hired by the mafia. Who knows? but they did know that he had something to do with this. And this was one of the speculations that they did. They thought that this guy was an marks, expert marksman and that maybe he had created this super wonderful rifle umbrella and he was able to shoot President Kennedy who was coming through a, a moving car and expertly hit him just perfectly using this umbrella and that's what it was. These at the time, seems crazy now, at the time these were valid, probable things that could have happened and why he might have been killed. But what really happened, I'm sure you're all wondering, what really happened was this guy was literally doing the weirdest thing at the worst time at the worst place. The story is, is that this man, he, he uh, came forward later, years later, his name was Louis Stephen Witt. And what he was doing, he was protesting. And who he was protesting wasn't President, Ken wasn't President Kennedy, it was actually his father, who was the ambassador to the UK and best buddies with Neville Chamberlain, the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom in the lead-up to World War II. And he, this protester, blamed him and Chamberlain for the appeasement policies that many believe led to World War II. And since Neville Chamberlain famously wore a dark three-piece suit and always carried around a black umbrella, in this guy's mind, he thought, oh, I'm going to stand outside the motorcade, and I'm going to have my suit on and my umbrella, and somehow President Kennedy's going to tie it all together, and he's going to, man, that protest, whoo, that got me. <laughs> Crazy! Once again, weirdest thing, worst place, worst time. Really, really, really unfortunate. So how, how are we going to tie this all together? I worry about this. How do I know in the heat of the moment, one question, who shot the president? I have one question. How do we grow our company? How do we prepare for the future? Seems really simple, but it's not. So how do you distinguish between an umbrella man, at the time it feels like it's real, and all of the real things I should be worrying about? It's very hard in the heat of the moment. And so I worry about that a lot. How do you overcome and understand and pick out what the Umbrella Man issues versus the others? Hard thing to do. And then the other is, from an organizational standpoint, Newton's first law. And Newton's first law is an object in motion tends to stay in motion or at rest tends to stay at rest unless acted upon by an unbalanced force. And the joke around work is that I'm unbalanced, so that's why, uh, that's why this applies. And it might be true. But, um, but it's really hard. So, you know, Organizations take on a personality. It has almost like a ma manifest habits. It likes to go this way. It likes to go that way. It has biases and weird, irrational things that they do. 
The organization does. And you have to have somebody on the outside to push or pull or cajole the organization one way or the other in order to take, take advantage of those disruptive things in this exponential world. It is not a small thing. For anyone that's tried to convince or tried to push an organization in a different way, not easy. So this leads me to where all of this is going is my frustration throughout my entire work life. I would have some great, present, some great idea that I thought was really important, and I would spend tons of time prepping and prepping and prepping for a presentation for whatever you know, senior level people that I needed to convince, and I'd give this presentation, and nine times out of 10, they'd say, man, that was awesome. That was great. What a great presentation. And then nothing would happen at all. There is nothing to me more frustrating in this world than doing a great job or giving a great presentation that went nowhere afterwards. I don't care about the presentation. I was giving the presentation in order to change behavior. And if it didn't happen, it was a waste. So my frustration with all of these issues, how do you identify what to do? How do you pick out the umbrella man problems versus the other things? And how do you convince people that this is something that we need to do and also get them going and get their behavior changed? Um, this all led to me searching for different ways to, to do all this. Not a small task. And we figured it out. Just spoiler alert. Okay. So the way that we did it, we tried a bunch of different ways, but we tried something called science fiction prototyping. And, and I won't go into all the detail, but essentially what we do, you know, science fiction writers are uniquely qualified and capable for taking all of the stuff that could possibly happen and then envisioning the future, probable futures. And we all relate to the future and to current new technologies and new things coming out largely based on science fiction we've seen in the scene, right? The Minority Report, which was out way a long time ago, now everyone thinks the future just involves doing a lot of this, right? It's just based on that movie. It's crazy, but we all believe that now. Narrative is really, really powerful, and people have been talking about using narrative to change organizations, especially businesses, for a long time, but what usually happens is it's just a chronological series of events. That's like using like a furniture assembly uh, diagram uh, to be able to explain something or as a story. That's not what it is. A story has characters. A story has conflict. A story has resolution, has a narrative arc. That is what a story is, right? You have a really hard day, and you come home, and you turn on the TV or you read a book, and you let stories wash over you. Think about how weird that is. We are set up to receive and love stories. Why don't we communicate in stories more? I don't know. So what we did is we hired these science fiction writers, we gave them our marketing research and trend data, and we sent them off in different directions, two years, five years, 10 years down the road, in the store, out of the store, in different, in different locations. And then they came, that was the only direction we gave them, and then they came back with real stories. Stories that had that conflict, those characters, that narrative arc. Pretty weird, huh? Then we took it a step further, made it even weirder, and we turned them into comic books. And the reason why we did that is that a, I like comic books, I have a large collection. Surprise, surprise, I'm sure. But the other is that, that comic books allow you to kind of, uh, it, it creates this, this gap where you're allowed, it suspends disbelief a bit. So if you've ever gotten a mean email in a funny font, it's kind of like that. Well, they can't be that mad because this font is so cute. It's kind of like that. So you're able to, it's not a PowerPoint presentation, it's something different that allows you to really get into the story and see the possibility rather than focus on what's on the next slide. Okay? So we literally did this the first time and literally passed it out to the senior executives of our company and we honestly and truly read comic books and they said, okay, I like that, I believe that, they got behind it and then they said, go and build this. Crazy, huh? Crazy, crazy. And this is an actual scene from the comic book that we did and in this story in the near future, this couple is renovating their home. But instead of just going to the store first, what they did, or searching online, they were able to envision using augmented and virtual reality and perfectly build out their space before doing anything, right? It's very hard to conceive how the floor might look and the paint and the backsplash and the ca kitchen cabinets and all of those things and see how they might look and then also make that decision with your significant other. It's very, very hard. And we know that that, that, that gap in, in visualization keeps many people from even starting a process. So being able to take that away was gonna be a big deal. And we knew someone was going to be able to do this in the near future. So then if you believe that, then why can't we? And so we said, sure. We didn't know what we were doing, but we, we, we started it. And we pulled together a, a bunch of what we call uncommon partners. And these uncommon partners, what that means is, it means just that. 
anyone that you wouldn't expect us to work with, the uncommon part, and real partners, real true partners, so we can have that honest feedback and dialogue and do things very quickly. And we literally built an augmented reality solution that allows you to perfectly build out your bathroom <coughs> from scratch, and you can walk around inside of it before you even buy anything. And they're all real Lowe's products. They're incredibly hyper-realistic. You actually feel the sense of how close things are to each other, and you have a very different experience. Pretty cool, huh? This is the actual hollow room that are in stores in Canada right now. These aren't just conceptual, they're in actual use uh, in stores in Canada right now. And people are actually using augmented reality and virtual reality in order to uh, build their bathrooms. So we didn't just do this once. We are like, this, this process really works. And so what we decided to do, the next story that we, we did, um, was about how it, it was funded on, founded on this, this idea that retail, the buying experience, really hasn't changed much in the last 100 years. I mean, essentially, you'd want to buy something, you'd go to a store, and you, that, those people in that store probably knew more about the thing that you wanted to buy than you did. And then you go in and make a decision and you walk out. So things really haven't changed that much. In this story, one of the key components, and there, this isn't the only one, are these robots that you talk to. And the robots do many, many things. They're fully autonomous. You talk to it. You can talk to it in English. You can talk to it in Spanish, other languages. Um, it can do a wide variety of other things. It fully it is a fully autonomous uh, robot and will navigate you to the exact part in the store that you're looking for. And this is it. Its name is Oshbot. And like I said, it's it combines a lot of the technologies that exist. It even has the same scanners that the driverless cars have. So it's able to constantly map and remap a store. You're even able to bring in a nail or a screw or whatever and hold it up to the scanner. And it will be able to tell you what it is and if we have it in the store. And then it will navigate you and take you to where it is in the store. Pretty cool, huh? And you can see the Oshbot roaming around the, uh, the store there. And then lastly, you know, it seems like, okay, there's this hollow room, Kyle, and there's like this uh, Oshbot, and you're doing all this stuff, and you're using uh, comic books. What, what's that really about? And really, this is from the Today Show in the U.S. It's a big uh, morning program with Carson Daly, and we were on there one morning, the entire morning. If you want to be nervous, try to hack your robot to talk to news anchors live on television all morning. Uh, <laughs> that was fun, but it worked. We were okay. Um, and the reason why we do these announcements, the reason why we do these things is because we want to put the proverbial bat signal out there. We want people to think of us as someone they can come and work with. We want to build our network of uncommon partners. And because we've talked loudly and done and we've taken, taken the risk, basically, of not only creating things but putting them out in the stores, like the hollow room and the robots, we have a lot of these new uncommon partners reaching out to us that never would have before. And what that's creating is a strong bond and different opportunities that we couldn't have bought if we wanted to um, because we were out there on the exponential curve and we're inviting others to be on that exponential curve. So lastly, change today is exponential. Who would have thought a very large home improvement retailer would have created the first natural language autonomous robot? Probably not. Who would have thought that, that the same retailer would also create the hollow room, which is the first virtual reality, augmented reality showrooms and stores? In, in large use? Probably not. And we're working on many other things too. So once again, that exponential curve, although a little bit scary, provides a lot of opportunity. And if we can do it, anyone can do it. But it's about embracing change and convincing others to do it with you. And those things are hard, but they are possible. Thank you.